Howdy, and welcome to Wise About Texas, the Texas History Podcast. This is your host, Ken Wise, and thank you very much for tuning in today to get your Texas history fix. Well, we're in that time of year that I like to call the high holy days of Texas history, 181 years since the Texas Revolution. Uh, This podcast is being released on February 28th, 2017, and during this time period in the soon-to-be Republic of Texas, the Alamo was under siege, and Travis was figuring out that uh, nobody was coming to help him and that he was on his own. Uh, But as he said in his letter that he wrote on February 24th, he vowed to never surrender, declaring victory or death. So this is a very important time period during uh, Texas history, and I definitely wanted to talk about the revolution, but there are some battles that really get a little bit of short shrift when we're talking about the Texas Revolution. We tend to focus on the Alamo, the massacre at Goliad, and then, of course, the great victory at the Battle of San Jacinto, but we leave a lot of things out. Um, The first, and I did an episode on this in the early days of this podcast, was the siege of Behar when we when the Texas um, revolutionaries took over San Antonio and kicked General Koss out, uh, that was a very, very important battle and had a lasting effect on the spirit of the men fighting. But there were some other battles that we really don't talk too much about. So today we're going to talk about uh, the invasion of Mexico at the port city of Tampico. So let's go back to 1835 and get wise about Texas. All right, to begin with, we've got to set the scene in Mexico in 1834. Um, or actually, let's go back one more year to 1833. In 1833, uh, Antonio Lopez de Santa Ana was elected president of Mexico. His vice president was Valentin Gomez Farias. And they were of different parties. So just chew on that for a minute, that the president and vice president Uh, were of different political parties. Um, But then Santa Ana did something that would characterize uh, many of his terms as president. He went home. He was more of a soldier uh, and an extensive landholder than he was a president. And so he took off, and he let Farias run the country as vice president. Now, Farias, being from a different party than Santa Ana instituted some reforms that were not to Santa Ana's liking. So he uh, decided to show up for work and change what Farias had done. So he came back and assumed the executive power that he had seemingly abdicated. Um, And that's when Santa Ana declared himself the dictator. And we've talked about that in other episodes. He abolished uh, many of the state legislatures. He dissolved the National Mexican Congress, he fired all his cabinet ministers, and he just took over and declared himself a dictator. Now, that, of course, did not sit well with the Mexican citizens, but it also changed the game in Texas because, uh, as we discussed in the last episode, the Texas was marching toward revolution, and the citizens were agitated enough. And when Santa Ana fully and finally Uh, abolished essentially the federalist system. That was just too much. Texas was not the only area that was rebelling against Santa Ana's dictatorship. The first problem that Santa Ana had to deal with was in the area of Zacatecas. He declared them an open rebellion. He took the army down there and crushed that rebellion, at which point he was going to turn his attention to the rebels in Texas. Among the people that had opposed Santa Ana were two individuals, one named George Fisher and one named Jose Antonio Mejia. And Mejia, as those of you from Texas know, is spelled M-E-X-I-A, pronounced Mejia. And they were in New Orleans. It was their idea to raise a force uh, attack back in Mexico and try to restore the Federalist government. And they weren't the only two, of course, trying this, but... Uh, They found themselves in New Orleans, and New Orleans was the largest city close to Texas and a hub of activity related to the burgeoning Texas Revolution. So this is an interesting little 
tidbit. There was a big meeting held in New Orleans on October 13th, 1835 at a place called Banks Arcade. Uh, there was a what well, was described as a mass public meeting to discuss how to aid Texas. And of course, Fisher and Mejia wanted to depose Santa Ana and restore the Federalist system. So as we discussed in the last episode, uh, during this time period, there were some that wanted Texas to be independent and make a clean break from Mexico, but there were still more that merely wanted to get rid of Santa Ana and go back to the Federalist system. So not necessarily declaring Texas independence, but just to get rid of Santa Ana and restore the government. So they have this mass public meeting in New Orleans, and they raised uh, a fair amount of money and uh, raised over 100 volunteers to go to Texas. But that was not all that was accomplished during this meeting. During this meeting, they agreed, they, the, the attendees of the meeting, and they had organized the meeting a little bit. They had a chairman, and they had split into some committees. They also organized support for an expedition against the Mexican city of Tampico. Now, the idea of attacking Tampico was to agitate all the Federalist sympathizers in the eastern part of Mexico and try to incite them into joining the revolution. And so they were going to enter the city, and everyone was going to get excited, was going to join with them, and uh, open up a basically a front of revolution uh, on the eastern part of Mexico. Fisher writes to Stephen F. Austin announcing this uh, Tampico plan. The provisional government of Texas, such as it was, uh, expressed support for this. Austin writes back, uh, or actually writes to the provisional government, saying we need to support Mejia and all his efforts. But Austin wanted Mejia to attack Matamoros. And, and again, the feeling was that if they could just get uh, – some very just get the people incited against Santa Ana that would all come together uh, and Santa Ana would be deposed and they could all live peacefully under the 1824 Constitution. So Austin advocates a move against Matamoros and Mejia sets out with his expedition force for Tampico. One more thing about the Matamoros uh, thinking Austin believed that, and he was probably right, that if you could take over Matamoros and put it in the hands of the Federalists, then that would cut off all the supplies, et cetera, to San Antonio de Bejar, and that Bejar would then be firmly in the hands of the Texas citizens who were um, Federalists, obviously, and that the uh, Texas would be free, the revolution would be successful. Mejia, on the other hand, wanted to go to Tampico and take over that area, and then he said he would uh, turn his force northward and, and go and march against Matamoros. So Mejia has set off. Now, he was a little bit delayed getting away from New Orleans, but he takes off in a boat and sails for Tampico. Now, Mejia was uh, fairly well-connected. I'll tell you a little bit about him. He had served, uh, he spoke very good English. He had served um, as Secretary of the State Congress of Tamaulipas, which is where Tampico was located, and uh, he had served in the United States as part of the Mexican legation. He had been a general in the Army. He was a staunch supporter of Santa Ana until Santa Ana uh, turned into a dictator. And so he had a lot of connections in Tampico, and he assured the Texas provisional government, that he was making contacts in Tampico. Those were his best contacts. He was going to, they knew he was coming. Uh, and I think in Mejia's mind, uh, he envisioned the city ready to receive him uh, as a hero and that they would all rise up and join him and, and the city would essentially fall to him fairly easily and then they could march on Matamoros. So that's what he was thinking as he approached Tampico. At this point, I need to mention that the Tampico expedition, and you'll hear the end of the story in a minute, um, and obviously doesn't end well, or you would know have known about it. But much of the history, when they talk about Tampico, if they talk about it at all, it's generally described as this lark uh, that Mejia took on on his own with no support and no input. And that's really not right. If you go back and read 
some of the sources closer, written much closer to the time, and, and actually some of the records that reflect the, the letters that went back and forth and the deliberations of the provisional government, there was a lot of support for what Mahay was doing. It was well known that he was playing this role, and uh, it was well known by the provisional government in Texas, and they were in favor of it, and they supported him every way that they could. So this was not just some wild hair that Mejia got to go attack on his own. This was something that the Texas government knew about and were very hopeful that it would work. And they were, they were very uh, much in favor of a multi-front uh, revolution. And uh, they thought that the, the citizens of Mexico would rise up with them and defeat Santa Ana. So as Mejia... Uh, left for Tampico, he sent two agents of his ahead. He called them commissioners, and he sent them ahead to Tampico to start uh, agitating and, and notifying the leaders that he was coming. So when he arrived um, outside the port, the pilot boat comes up to Mahea's ship. He had a schooner. It was named the Mary Jane. Uh, the pilot boat pulls up. And much to Mahaya's dismay, the pilot knows nothing of who he is or why he's there. So Mahaya immediately says, well, I'm here to uh, take over Tampico and, and lead a revolution against Santa Ana, which uh, the captain of the pilot boat immediately joined. So he got lucky and found a sympathizer in the pilot. But what he realized was that his commissioners had not done their jobs, and so he wasn't exactly sure what he was going to face when he landed, but he was fairly sure that it was not going to be this rousing reception from fellow revolutionaries. So he decided to wait until dark to make his landing. In the meantime, a bit of bad luck. Uh, While he was outside the bar uh, at the port of Tampico, the ship ran aground, and so did the tug that the pilot was on. So both ships have run aground. So instead of being able to land during the night, they were trying to get the ships off the bar. They finally managed to do that, and they made landfall. There was a fort there. And what they discovered was that the soldiers in the fort were, in fact, on their side. They were ready to join the revolution. But the problem was uh, they the men had had to wade ashore because they couldn't get the ships off the bar in time. And So now they had lost a lot of their powder, gotten wet, their muskets were wet, and so they had to sit around the fort, dry their clothes, dry their uh, what little ammunition they had left, and uh, dry their rifle, their muskets out. And his bad luck continued because though he had the soldiers and much of the citizenry on his side, they had a new company of Mexican troops that arrived in town right after he landed. So there was a little skirmish uh, between the soldiers that Mejia had won over and the soldiers that had just arrived in town. When this skirmish happened, the people that had assembled to support Mejia upon his landing panicked, and they went back to the town acting as if they had never been a part of any revolutionary activities. Uh, So they basically abandoned Mejia. Mejia marches on the town. He has some military success, uh, but not a lot, and uh, ends up retreating back to the fort. And interestingly, was there for about 10 days. He was uh, in the fort, and the Mexican army was not attacking him. His problem was, though, that he, as we mentioned earlier, had extremely low ammunition, very little food, And he had sent more dispatches to the interior of Mexico, basically saying, hey, guys, I'm here. Come, you know, rush to my aid. Now's the time. And no help came. With no help and no uh, very little ammunition and very little food and very little money, uh, the troops, as they sometimes do, got discontented and were no longer willing to sit there and fight for Mejia. So it wasn't looking very good. The Mexican commander, in the meantime, began rousing the citizens, saying that uh, Mejia was a Texan, and the, all the soldiers were Texans, and they were trying to fight for Texas independence, and that they were, you know, he called on the patriotism of the citizens to uh, turn against Mejia. Well, uh, that did it. Mejia saw the writing on the wall. 
He goes down uh, out of the fort, goes down to the port, charters a, a ship called the Halcyon, which was an American ship, and he takes off uh, back to Texas. The problem uh, that some of his soldiers had is that 31 of them were taken prisoner. Three of them had been wounded. They later died. The rest were given a quick court-martial and executed in December of 1835. Before their execution, they were allowed to write sort of the, they call them dying statements or their last words. And many of them claimed that they didn't even know they were going to attack Tampico when they got on the boat. They thought they were just getting a free ride to Texas. And it wasn't until they arrived that Mejia informs them, well, you know, we're really going to attack Mexico. So, I, you know, those statements probably uh, are not terribly accurate, to be honest. Uh, but they were trying everything they could to avoid uh, the death sentence. The Mexican government, on the other hand, wanted to make an example of them. Remember, this is uh, a time period where Santa Ana had just finished suppressing a fairly violent rebellion in Zacatecas. Uh, he was preparing to march on Texas, and he was not going to tolerate any sort of revolutionary activity. So they wanted to make an example of those prisoners that they had, uh, and that's why they executed them. Now, the newspapers in New Orleans... Um, interestingly, uh, wrote, some of them wrote that they found the executions to be uh, justifiable. This got a lot of press. Uh, this incident, of course, got a lot of press in the United States. And there was a, there was a liberal Mexican paper that was written uh, out of New Orleans, published out of New Orleans. And they made the argument that, uh, that these soldiers should have been treated as prisoners of war, which would have been, of course, sort of a confession that revolution was in the air, uh, but they thought they should be either treated as prisoners of war or uh, if they were in fact treated as pirates, then a military court really had no jurisdiction to court-martial them. But uh, of course that all fell on deaf ears in Mexico and they were in fact executed. So Mejia's plan did not work. Uh, the 31 people executed at Tampico became martyrs to the Texas Revolution. Um, Mejia arrives back in Texas, and there was a lot of talk reaching the provisional government uh, that despite Mejia's disastrous failed invasion, that he was right about the liberals in Mexico. The liberals were the ones that supported the Federalist government and opposed Santa Ana. Uh, the communications were that there was a lot of uh, sympathy uh, in the interior of Mexico, and lots of people ready and willing to aid Mejia. So he was he was not incorrect when he claimed that that the strategy of attacking and inciting revolution within Mexico uh, would have worked. Um, and of course, we know Stephen F. Austin believed that too. But um, what they discovered, and in, in, in December of 1835. Uh, Mejia's expeditions and these theories of revolution were very much discussed by the Texas uh, provisional government, but they discovered one very important fact in the meantime, and that was that Santa Ana was marching to Bejar with his army, and that changed the game. And so they uh, steered Mejia away from an attack on Mexico and uh, tried to get him to go reinforce the troops at Bejar, which he refused to do. So the Battle of Tampico, the Tampico Expedition, as it's referred to, uh, was not a happy moment for the Texas Revolution, uh, but it is a battle. It did, uh, it occurred, and 31 uh, prisoners ended up being executed. And we certainly can fairly say that that was part of the Texas Revolution. Now, here's a little tidbit I don't think you've heard. Uh, there is a firsthand account from a San Jacinto veteran that claims that every account that you read talks about Sam Houston rousing the troops, telling them to remember the Alamo and remember Goliad. But this particular account describes the men as not only yelling, remember the Alamo and remember Goliad, but also yelling as they attack Santa Ana's troops, remember Tampico. Well, now we come to the part of the episode called Getting There, where I tell you how to go see some of the places that we talk about in the episode. That's a little bit difficult with this episode because we really only talked about Tampico. So you can, uh, 
head down to Mexico, visit Tampico if you'd like. Uh, I would not recommend sailing there from New Orleans. That would be a little more of an effort, uh, but you're certainly welcome to try to retrace those steps. Uh, the provisional government, of course, was sitting at Washington and the Brazos, which we've discussed many times. And uh, so there's really not a lot to see in connection with this episode. I'll post some pictures of uh, the fort and such on the website. But the uh, center of American activity in connection with Mahia's expedition and the site of the mass meeting and the, and the port from which Mahia left was New Orleans. So uh, this episode's being released, as I mentioned earlier, February 28th, two, 2017, which is Mardi Gras 2017. So on that note, I suggest that you proceed immediately to New Orleans and uh, enjoy the Mardi Gras festivities. And while you're there, think about Texas. Well, that wraps it up for this episode of Wise About Texas, the forgotten battles of the Texas Revolution. The next episode will cover a couple of more, and I hope that uh, you're sharing this show with your friends. The download numbers are increasing, and I really appreciate it. I'm getting a lot of great feedback. Tell me what Texas history stories you'd like to hear. Uh, Like and share the Facebook page, Wise About Texas, and you can follow the show on Twitter and Instagram at wise about texas so thank you very much for listening to this episode go out and do something for texas today and until next time god bless texas and we'll see you down the road